Thou hast made my days as in hand breath, and mine age is as together vanity sila in verse number three i want to uh, take some time and focus on psalm 39 and verse number three let's read that together again my heart was hot within me while i was musing the fire burned then spake i with my tongue let's i'm going to start i'm going to talk to you this evening on this subject my heart was hot within me my heart was hot within me let's have a word of prayer heavenly father thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening i sure do love you dear lord and i'm so grateful for all that you do for us thank you dear lord for being a wonderful god now at this time holy spirit of god i yield myself to you i ask you to fill me with your power i ask you lord for the mind of christ help me to say only that which you once said and i pray lord for every person here and every person watching online that everyone will have ears to hear a heart to receive and a mind to comprehend and Father, please do a work in our midst that only you can do. I pray that you would please be with our uh, live stream, that nothing would go wrong from now till the end of the service. And I pray, dear Lord, for our country, that you please help us to have revival. What a sad shape our country is in right now. And Lord, please help us to have revival. Let it start with us, and we'll give you all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. So, uh, let's see here. I'm trying to... Uh, cotton picking, corn pulling, piece splitting, uh, the crazy uh, website, uh, whatever this thing is called, live stream. I'm trying to get to the point where I can reshare it just real quick, if you can hold on just for a second so that people can watch it. But uh, there we go. Woohoo! And, um, you know, Facebook is, is, is crazy. I, um, I'm an administrator on our website or on our Facebook page for Hopewell. And all of a sudden, Facebook changed. I can't, it won't let me share the videos through Watch Party. I, I can't do it. Are you all able to share the videos through Watch Party? Has someone been able to do that? Like you hit the share button, it goes to Watch Party and then Watch Party. I can't do it anymore. And I'm an administrator on the crazy thing. But at any rate, praise the Lord. Facebook is just uh, anti-God. At any rate, <laughs> all righty, here we go. My heart was hot within me. The psalmist said, uh, in fact, David is the one that wrote this psalm. Um, he was thinking about some things. It said, my heart was hot within me while I was musing the fire burned. Y'all know what the word musing means? It means to ponder in your mind. It means to dwell on thoughts. <clears throat> Some of us might consider musing daydreaming. You know, like if you're just, you're lost in thought while you're, while you're thinking, right? You know, your mind just goes to something and it just stays on that something. Well, a lot of us muse throughout our lives. Hopefully we don't do it while we're driving. That'd be scary, huh? To start daydreaming while you're driving. Have you ever driven somewhere and you pull up in your, like, like you left somewhere and came to your house, pulled up in your driveway and you thought to yourself, how did I get here? Isn't that crazy? That's scary, right? We get on autopilot. You know, one, one, one person worded it this way, um, let's see, about the cows uh, heading back to the back to the barn or something I, uh, how does that saying go and uh but anyway uh heading back to the barn you know just like when it's time to go home and just go like clockwork you know and um but the fact of the matter is david was musing about certain things and while he was musing it says his heart was hot within him and that a fire burned you know what's the problem with a lot of churches and a lot of christians in our country we don't have any fire in our hearts we're apathetic you know if you go to church if you come to church and the preacher's preaching and you find yourself daydreaming you know not listening to the sermon you find yourself sleeping you find yourself distracted with social media internet things like that well your heart's not burning for god if you come to church and, and you're yearning to listen and you want God to speak to your heart, then that's what it means to have a hot heart. I think a lot of Christians become calloused. We become ho-hum. We uh, go to church and we go through the motions and we're not fired up. What, one of the things I've observed in 26 years of pastoring is a lot of times those that are saved, brand new saved, like they just got saved, they're more excited than those who've been saved for 20 years. 
for 30 years or for 40 years. And to be honest with you, that's not right. I mean, if you are saved and you've been saved for 20, 30, 40 years, your heart, your heart ought to be hotter than someone who's been saved for one month or for two months. I mean, you really should. But this is the human nature. This is our weakness. This is our frailty. This is our sin nature. Uh, we get commonplace with something, and we just get, you know, casual about it. We just go, oh, hum, you know, like, you know, <laughs> if anybody ever says amen, it's a holy grunt instead of an amen, you know, <clears throat> you know and uh, not really into it. But the, the, the psalmist, David, he said, my heart was hot within me while I was musing. The fire burned. And what he was saying is, while I let my mind think about certain things, it caused my heart to get hot, to get stirred up. Tonight, by the way, what will, what will happen if, you're, if you let your heart get hot? Three things. Letter A, you'll start to care more. You know, when someone has a hot heart, they're fired up, they generally speak and they care more. If your heart gets cold or stony, it honestly is a lack of caring. And, and the more hot your heart can become, the more you care, the more you feel deeply, the more, the more love that you possess. I worry about Christians who are cold-hearted. I worry about Christians who can take or leave church, who don't really care about the preaching, who don't really pay attention because their heart's not in it. But if you let your heart get hot, you'll care more, let her be. You'll also have your eyes open. You'll have your eyes open. You know, too many of us walk around in our lives like this. Don't blind me with the truth. Don't blind me with the truth. I just, I'm happy where I'm at. No, get your eyes open. And the more your heart gets hot, the more you'll care, and the more you'll open your eyes. You know. <laughs> the media, especially the mainstream media, they're evil. They're wicked. They have an agenda to feed you, to lie to you, to deceive you, to try to get you to go along their plot and their plan. And America needs to open their eyes and just realize the media is not your friend. You know, President Trump called them fake news. He said they're the enemy of the American people. I believe it with all my heart. A lot of it is fake news, and a lot of it is to hurt America, the enemy of America. But, but what happens is, you know, people who don't have their eyes open, they just hear whatever they hear on the news, and then they just accept it to be true. That's kind of like, hey, I saw it on the Internet. Must be true. <laughs> you saw it on the Internet? <laughs> Must be true. Uh, I saw this one picture on social media one time about Abraham Lincoln. And it said something about even Abraham Lincoln knows not, not everything on the Internet is true. He wasn't alive when the Internet was, you know. But, but the fact is somebody would say, oh, wow, Abraham Lincoln knew, you know, something about the Internet. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, listen, we got to have our eyes open. The more your eyes are open, the better your life is going to be. There, there's a story in, in the book of Acts about the church of Berea. They were called the Bereans. And what the Bereans did was they came to church and they heard the Apostle Paul preach and they had the Bible of their own at home. And so they would study the Bible every single day, it says, to see if those things were so that they heard at church. That's awesome. You know, there's not one verse in the Bible that threatens me. There's not one verse in the Bible that I'm afraid of. I want you to have your eyes open. I would much rather you be students of the Bible, understanding how valuable church is, and an agreement with me when I preach, as long as I preach the word, amen? That's awesome. But I don't want you to blindly follow me. Whatever Pastor Sulian says is right. Well, I appreciate you having a devotion toward me, but I'm not God. God's God. You know, I want you to say anything that God says is right, you know. But with me, I don't mind if you study the Bible and have your eyes open, you know, when you come here. Now, I'm not saying 
always have the church on trial. I'm not saying that. I mean, once you establish this is where God wants you and this is, you know, God's will for your life, then just bury it. Just say, you know what? Pastor's human just like I am. He's going to make mistakes just like I do. He'll sin just like I do. And, uh, you know, we love each other. We're part of the family of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't have you on trial. You don't have me on trial. You know, we find God's will. We love it, you know, live in it. But have your eyes open while you're here. Have your eyes open. You know, we are human, right? And sometimes some things might go wrong, and we have to have our eyes open to make sure we're paying attention. So if something does go wrong, we can correct it, you know? But it's not like, oh, something went wrong. I'm bailing ship. I'll never come back to that church again. No, that's not the idea. You know, if God brought us here, let's have our eyes open, pay attention, but let's fix the problems. Let's, let's make things better, right? But when it comes to the Word of God, you know, have your eyes open. Know what the Bible says. I mean, that's awesome. What will happen if your heart is hot? The third thing, letter C, you'll want to do something about it. If your heart gets hot, you'll want to do something about it. You see, David said, while I was musing, the fire burned. It says, then spake I with my tongue. So you know what, you know what David said? He says, I was musing, my heart got hot, then I did something about it. You know, the last thing I want to do, the last thing I want to do is watch the world go by me while I sit on my couch. That's the last thing I want to do. I don't want to see the kingdom of God, you know, souls getting saved, people getting baptized, lives getting changed. You know, we're supporting 75 missionaries. We're going to vote to see if we can support some more for 2021. I don't want to see all that happen right in front of my eyes and then me not do anything about it. I don't want the kingdom of God just to pass me by. I want to be involved. It starts with the condition of your heart. If your heart gets hot, you'll care, you'll have your eyes open, and then you'll want to do something about it. There are six things I'm going to give you tonight. That was all introduction. There are six things I'm going to give you tonight about my heart getting hot about. Number one, look at Proverbs chapter 2. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2, look down at verse number 12. Proverbs chapter 2, verse number 12, please. Proverbs chapter 2 and verse number 12, the Bible says, To deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil, and delight in the forwardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked, and they forward in their paths. To deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God. For her paths inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. None that go on turn again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. In verse 17, it says, which forsaketh the guide of her youth. Number one, write this down. My heart gets hot within me, write this down, number one, about the youth of America. My heart gets hot when I think about the youth of America, how they are forsaking the guide of their youth, how they're forgetting the covenant of their God. And it says their house, often it says, inclineth unto death, her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. You know what I hurt, you know what I hurt my heart about as I muse about these things? The youth that forsakes the guide that they were taught when they were young. And now all the years that they're away from God are wasted. It never comes back. You know, I thank God for the prodigal son as the prodigal son you know, returns home. But here's the sad part of the story. None of those years that he was gone in the world in the pig pen, they cannot be reclaimed. They're gone forever. And my heart aches, my heart hurts when I think about children who are raised in a church like this, who become adults and they just forsake the guide of their youth and they just live in the world and live in all kinds of sinful lifestyles without any regards to God and the things of God. And my heart hurts. Why? Because first of all, they may not come back. Second of all, if they do come back, you know, all those years are wasted. And my heart hurts for them. 
My heart gets fired up about the condition of our teenagers in our country. Look at Proverbs 7. Look down at verse number 7 to, about the youth. Look at uh, Proverbs 7 and verse 7. We're going to read to the end of the chapter. It says, And beheld among the simple ones I discerned among the youths, a young man void of understanding. Now, what happens to this youth, this young man who's void of understanding? Well, it says, by, verse 8, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house. Look what it says. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. Every once in a while, young people say things like, what's wrong with being out and about at night when it's 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning? Not good. Not good. Some youth says, ah, <laughs> you can do fine at 11 o'clock at night, at 12 o'clock at night, at 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, really? No, I'm afraid not. There's a reason why this youth was void of understanding. He was out in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. Let's continue. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot. If you don't know what the attire of a harlot is, that means you can wear clothes that is not good for you to wear. Your clothing, honestly, it tells off on the condition of your heart. So when you look at someone, or this particular person, she had the attire of a harlot. You know why? Because she was a harlot. Her clothing told off on the condition of her heart. Let's continue. And subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without. Now in the streets. And lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him. This is the young man void of understanding. And kissed him. And with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee. Diligently to seek thy face. And I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home. She was married. He has gone a long journey. He had taken a bag of money and with him and will come home at the day appointed with her much fair speech. She, she, uh, um, she causeth him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway, as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stalks, till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend unto the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Who was it that caught this young man? This young man that was void of understanding. The adulterous woman. What's this young man doing? in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night, walking up and down the streets of this city. I'll tell you exactly what he was doing. He was inviting trouble, and he found it. And I feel so much for the youth that don't understand that, that don't understand that there's danger in the world. There's people out there that would love to do nothing more than to destroy your life. There are people out there that hate Christianity. And their goal is to wipe it out from the youth of our country. My heart gets hot within me when I think about that. I worry about those of us that are members of this church who have our children in a public school. You know, I was reading in the newspaper today about a city in Tennessee who found out or observed that parents were, were listening in on their students' on their children as they were being taught online. And the teachers got mad about it. And they sent a letter home or an email or whatever you want to call it and told the parents, you are not allowed to watch while your student is in my class. And if you watch online while my, while, while my student is in my class, I'm going to kick your student out of our school. I'm going to kick your child out. They were having a fit that the parents were now listening to what their children were being taught. You know what that smacks of? The government thinks they own your children, not you, parents. 
and they don't want you interfering with the doctrine that they're teaching your children when they're in the public school. How scary is that? The government does not own your children. The Bible says God has given the children to the parents. It's the parents' right and the parents' responsibility to make sure that their children are safe and they're taught right. And the public school wants to, a lot of times, endanger your children and get them manipulated from conservative values, from a love for our country, from, God bless you, from a love for our president. You know, people show their true colors when President Trump got coronavirus and people criticized him. People wanted him to die. People got mad at him. People said, good, that's karma. It's amazing. It's amazing. You should never vote for a single one of those cotton picking, corn pulling, peace splitting people. I don't want a liberal to get coronavirus. I don't want a liberal or a socialist to die. I'm not, I'm not praying that they get it so they can, you know, it'll cause them harm. That's, that's wicked. That's evil to wish ill on somebody. But yet, a lot of times our kids are being manipulated to do that. A lot of times they are. Listen, I fear for our youth. I care about our youth. As I look at our youth, by the way, our youth are so impressionable. Do you realize in the public school right now, they are teaching sex education starting in third grade? And it's not just sex education. They're teaching transgenderism. They're teaching homosexuality. They're teaching them all the ways of the thinking of the world. Listen, sex ed needs to be taught at home by mom and dad not in the school. We've had a school for 20 years at Hopewell Baptist Academy. We have not one time ever taught sex ed, and we never will. It's not the place of the school to, to teach sex ed. It's the place of the mom and the dad, the parents of the children, when they feel it's right, when they feel it's appropriate to teach their children about those types of things. It's not the public school's responsibility. But you see, it's an agenda, and my heart gets burning. My heart cares about these kids and the youth of our country as I see them go down the direction that they're going. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Just one, one book over from Proverbs. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Somebody say amen tonight. Amen. By the way, this is, the, this is what you call the meat of the word. This is not the milk of the word. Wednesday night is called T-bone steak time at Hopewell Baptist. That's what Wednesday night is. Sunday morning, a lot of times, Sunday morning is the milk of the word. And uh, Wednesday night is T-bone steak, all right? Look at Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1. Look what God says about the youth. It says, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. You know what God says about the youth? They're supposed to remember God while they're young. So many of our youth are programmed to forget about God while they're young. And years later, when we, when we settle down, when we're married, when we have kids of our own, then it'll be like, oh yeah, church. Oh yeah, God. No, God says, remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. My heart is hot within me about the youth of America. Number two, look at Psalm 9. Look at Psalms chapter 9 and verse number 17. Psalms chapter 9. In verse number 17, Psalms chapter number 9, in verse number 17, the Bible says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Number two, my heart is hot within me about America turning her back on God. About America turning her back on God. The Bible says, all the nations that forget God, they're going to be turned into hell. All the nations that forget God. I see it every day. I see it in the news. I see it in our community. I see it in our politics. A time and time and time again, America is forgetting about God. America is turning her back to God. And you know what? This is a very, very scary time in, in, in America right now. If the election doesn't go in the way that's towards God, it's only going to get worse. I see the rioting. I see the, 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 the not caring about life. I see the abortions. How, look, look, look. 
how can we protect all the different species of animals that we protect in our country, but we don't have enough sense to protect our unborn? How in the world is, I mean, you could go to jail for a long time if you crush a bald eagle's egg. If you crush the egg of a bald eagle, that's a felony. You can go to jail for a long time. But right now, in the state of Colorado, you can have an abortion all the way up to the birth of the child, the due date of the child. But yet, the, the American bald eagle, the, 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 the egg, the baby of a bald eagle is more valuable than the life of a baby in the womb of its mother. We're crazy. We've forgotten God. We have absolutely forgotten God. And as I think about it, my heart burns. I care. My eyes are open. And I want to do something about it. I want to help my country come back to God. You say, how can you do that? Well, look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles chapter number 7, please. 2 Chronicles 7, a very, very famous verse. Many of you have probably memorized it or at least seen it. Um, on social media, in uh, paintings, in pictures, hung on walls. But Second Chronicles chapter 7, and uh, verse number 14, please. Second Chronicles chapter 7 said, what can we do about it? Here's what we can do about it. Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse number 14. The Bible says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then... Will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin, watch this, and will heal their land. You know, America needs to be healed right now. America needs to be healed right now. And the only one who can do that is God. So God says that my people, which are called by my name, that's us, folks, that's Christians in America. My people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. We've got to get that pride out of our hearts shall humble themselves and pray. We need to start spending more time praying than we do on the internet. We need to pray more. They'll humble themselves and pray and seek my face. That means really want to know God, want to be close to God, want to know what God thinks about everything, want to learn from God. And then it says, turn from their wicked ways. When we have a national revival like that, then the Bible says, God says, I'll hear your prayer. I'll forgive your sin and I'll heal your land. You know what? I'm not a Christian who's an American that just wants to gripe about what is happening in our country. I want to do something about it. I want to humble myself. I want to pray. I want to seek God's face. I want to turn from my wicked ways, and then I want to have God hear my prayer and forgive me of my sin and then heal our land. I want to be a part of the answer, the solution, not the problem. And I don't want to just sit there and gripe about all that's going on. I want to be aware of what's going on, and then I want to do what I can to make it better. The, the truth of the matter is America has forgotten God. America has turned her back on God, and that causes my heart to be hot within me, and it causes my heart to burn. And what does that mean? If my heart burns for America, that means I'm going to care, and my eyes will be open, and I'll want to do something about it. Is your heart burning tonight about America? Or do you just... You just sort of say, oh, well, it's just politics. Oh, well, it's just the way it's going to be. Nothing we can do to change it. Is that how you feel? No. Let your muse a while on it. Let God give you some thoughts to think about and let your heart burn so that you'll care about our country and have your eyes open and then do something about it. Number three, look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Go to the New Testament now. We're doing good on time. Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter 8. And if you wouldn't mind looking down at verse number 5. Romans chapter number 8. This is the third point. We're halfway home. I only got six points. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 5. The Bible says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against god for it is not subject to the law of god neither indeed can be so then they that are in the flesh cannot please god my heart is hot within me number three about carnal 
Christianity. About carnal Christianity. You know what I see in our, in our day and age in America right now? I see a whole bunch of Christians complaining about the old-fashioned way of Christianity. I see a whole bunch of Christians wanting to blend in with the world. You know, sometimes as I observe Christians on social media, and I observe Christians in public, you know, I can hardly tell the difference between them and an unbeliever. They don't have that aura about themselves, that countenance that shines for God. I mean, they look exactly like the, an unsaved person. You know, I've often said something like this. You know, if you were ever charged with a crime of being a Christian and you had to appear before the court, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Amen. If you were charged with the crime of being a Christian, could they mount up a case substantial enough of evidence that the judge would say, yeah, you are a Christian, you're guilty of being a Christian. Well, you should want to live your life in such a way that nobody in your life doubts what side of the fence you're on. That doubts if you believe in God, if you love the Lord. Hey, if someone tells dirty jokes around you, why do you think they're doing that? I mean, do you think someone would come to me as the pastor of this church and tell a dirty joke? No way. Usually when people cuss around me, they say, oh, excuse me, Reverend. <laughs> they usually say something like that. Why? Because I have the testimony of being someone who believes in God, who loves the Lord. And so, but, but listen, if people, you know, if people just do wrong things around you, it might be because they feel comfortable. Let me ask you a question. Has anybody ever taken God's name in vain in your presence? Have you ever asked them politely, please don't do that? You're talking about my Savior. Please don't do that. Someone comes to you and, and takes Jesus' name in vain or says God, you know, thinking his last name is, starts with the letter D, you know, and you don't say anything about it? You know what? They feel comfortable saying that kind of thing around you. But it's a big deal to take God's name in vain. You know what we have today? We have in our society in 2020, Christianity that says, why do we have to do it the old fashioned way? Why can't we do it the new way? Forget the hymns. I want the new music, the music that makes me dance while I'm singing to the Lord. The music that makes me, you know, wave and, 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 and jiggle and wiggle and all that stuff. Man, come on, what's wrong with the old fashioned hymns? It's, it's really what God says is right. The Bible even has the word hymns in the Bible. It says we're supposed to sing to ourselves psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. In our day and age, we have nothing but, for the most part, a carnal approach to Christianity. We've got Christians who don't want to dedicate their lives to God. How many times have I heard in the 26 years I've been pastoring Christians that just say, just let me go to church and that's it. One hour a week. Leave me alone. Don't make me feel bad about money. Don't make me feel bad about serving. Don't make me feel bad about going to church more than just once. Hey, just accept this one hour and let me have the other 167 hours for myself this week. You know what? As I read the book of Acts, I see Christians who fell in love with God. I see Christians who, the Bible says in the book of Acts, they sold their lands, their houses, and they gave it to the work of God. I see how they met daily in the house of God. I see how they got persecuted. And they were driven from their homes. And what did they do? They went to these cities that they were driven to. And they started churches. And they kept meeting with people. They kept telling people about the Lord. They loved God. They lived for God seven days a week. It wasn't a one hour a week thing. It was they were consumed with Christianity. They were dedicated. You know what? And God says they turned the world upside down. In the book of Acts, it says, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Let me ask you a question. Do you think in America, Christians are turning America upside down for God? Doesn't seem like it to me. It's probably because we don't have as much dedicated Christians anymore.
And when I look and I see the carnal Christians that live in our society, my heart burns. I care about them. I have my eyes open to what's going on, and I want to do something about it. I want to help guide them in the right way, in the old paths. The Bible says, desire the old paths, wherein is the good way, and walk therein. That's what God says. You know, your grandmother and grandfather really knew some things about life that this younger generation don't know. You know what your grandma and grandma, chances are your grandmother and grandpa lived in an America where they never locked the front door. They lived in an America where they left the keys in the car when they pulled into their driveway and never took the keys out. They lived in an America, if they saw someone walking down the side of, side of the road, they would pull over and say, can I give you a lift somewhere, my friend? And wouldn't have to be worried about them, you know, killing them for their car. It was when a man's word was, its, was his bond, back when grandma and grandpa were alive. If a man said he'd do something, you didn't have to put your name on a piece of paper. You didn't have to you know, leverage against anything. A man's word was his bond. And people were just different back then. You know what? America's missing that. And a lot of it has to do with the way Christians don't want to be spiritual. They want to be carnal. It's like, I want to have my home from heaven, and I want to live in the pleasures of the world at the same time. And that's their approach. And the Bible says those that are in the flesh cannot please God. And it says the carnal mind is enmity with God, the enemy of God. My heart burns when I think about carnal Christianity. Number four, look at Matthew 7. Man, I could spend an hour on each one of these points. You'd be sleeping after the first 30 minutes, though. <laughs> Matthew 7. Look down at verse 15. I've only got about 10 minutes left. Matthew 7. Look at verse 15 through 20. Are you there? Matthew's the first book of the New Testament. Matthew 7, verse 15. Look what it says. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Look over at chapter 15, please. Turn over Matthew chapter 15. And again, I wish I could spend an hour on this. Matthew 15, look at verse 1. Matthew 15. In verse 1 it says, then came, the, uh, then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitudes and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth the man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth the man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended? After they heard this saying, but he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders. <coughs> Excuse me. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. The fourth thing that my heart is hot within me is, Number four, about false religions and false doctrines. False religions and false doctrine. Man, it's permeating everywhere in America. And it's so easy to get false doctrine 
and false teachings on the internet today. I've seen YouTube videos ruin more Christians' lives than, than when it comes to doctrine than just about anything else. You've got to be careful. You've got to be careful. I'm not saying all of the internet is bad, but it is a dangerous place, and there's a lot on there that's bad. You know, the fact of the matter is, listen, beware of false prophets, and the Bible says you'll know them by their fruit. I remember one time years ago, I'm talking 15, 16, 17, whatever it was years ago, a man came to this church. I led him to the Lord. He got baptized in our church. He started serving God in our church, and he started growing in the Lord, and all of a sudden, he's, he, he stopped coming. And I tried to get a hold of him. He wouldn't. He wouldn't answer the phone. I sent him text messages. He wouldn't respond. And then finally, one day, after about three or four weeks of him being gone, he finally answered the phone. I think I called him from a number that he didn't recognize. At any rate, I said, man, I've been missing you. And he goes, ah, I'm not coming back. I found a new church to go to. I said, really? I said, well, what happened? What was wrong? He goes, nothing. He goes, Hopewell was a good stepping stone. Now I'm going to a better church, and I'm going to learn more, and I, I, um, I'm, that's where I'm going. I said, okay. So he left a church, Hopewell, that was seeing people saved and baptized on a weekly basis, that was preaching the truth, seeing lives change, and he left our church and went to a church that didn't hardly see anybody saved, didn't really stand for the truth, and wasn't going to help him. What, what was going on? Somehow, somewhere, he got messed up with false teaching. It's like Brother Hiles used to teach at, at First Baptist Church in Hammond. He'd say people would leave, you know, the soul winning churches to go to a deeper life church. Then Brother Hiles always used to say, there is no deeper life than the life of a soul winner. Can you imagine living your whole life studying the Bible and never seeing anybody saved? How shallow is that? If you study the Bible, it ought to propel you to do something like reach the lost and make a difference in people's lives. I was talking to people often, and they say, I don't like going to church, but I love reading my Bible. And I say, that's funny. How can you love reading the New Testament when all, it, all throughout the New Testament it talks about church? Are you listening to what you're reading? Do you understand how much God loves church? How can you be close to God and hate church? It doesn't make sense. Now, I'm not saying every church. Obviously, they are bad apples. I mean, you know what I mean. There's some, there's some bad churches, bad preachers, bad religions. I mean, there, there are. But, but you can't just throw the whole thing away. I remember one time, years ago, there was a um, Vill, um, Perkins Village, something right down here on Maine and, uh, Maine and uh, Ken Pratt. Oh, my soul. This is like 20 years ago, 20 they had some bad service. Oh, they had some really bad food. I mean, I went like three times trying to, you know, just giving them, you know, just trying, you know. I didn't want to just leave the first time I had a bad experience, but it was like three times in a row. Bad food, bad service, bad everything. After three times, I said, you know what, I'm not going back. Do you know what I didn't do? I didn't say, I'm not going to any restaurant ever again. In the whole world. <laughs> I just wasn't going back to that restaurant. Now, if you've ever had a bad experience at a church, it's okay not to go back to that church. I mean, if it's legitimate, if it's, if, if it's really a bad church, don't go back. But don't throw all churches away. You don't do that with restaurants. You don't do that with doctors. Man, I had this dentist office. There, okay, I went to this Mountain View Avenue Comfort Dental. It was anything but comfort. I mean, it was bad. I think I spent five thousand dollars getting my mouth worked on, and to th this is like fifteen years ago. And to this day, my mouth still hurts because of what they did. So you know what I did? I'm just not ever going back there again. But I'm not going to not ever go to dentists anymore. You see what I'm saying? You know, uh, I don't throw the whole industry away because there's one bad apple. You don't do that to church either. So the fact of the matter is, is this? I look. My heart gets hot in my heart when I start thinking about false religions and false doctrines, YouTube videos, lies and deceptions, and what good Christian people, they, they get deceived by these false prophets, and the Bible says by their fruit you'll know them, and it says they're blind leading the blind, and they're both going to fall into the ditch. So I want to do something about it. I want to point out error, heresy, false doctrine. 
and warn you about it so you don't wind up in the ditch. Number five, we've got to hurry. Look at John chapter 4, just a couple, couple verses and we're done. I told you I could preach a long time. John chapter 4, and look down at verse number 35. John chapter 4, y'all still glad to be here tonight? Is the internet still working? Good night. Crazy live stream. Turned off before you got here, Brother Tim. Shut off again. Crazy live stream. All right. John chapter 4, look at verse 35. Look what it says now. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. My heart, my heart gets hot within me, number five, about souls on their way to hell. About souls on their way to hell. Write down this reference, Jude, verses 22 and 23. The Bible says, and if some have compassion, making a difference. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. You know what God says? There are people all around us. They may not know it. They may not be aware of it, but they're headed for hell. And those of us who have the truth, we know about how to be saved. We know about Jesus. We know about the cross and how much Jesus loves them. If they'll just believe in him and call upon his name, he'll save them. We got the good news, but you know what's sad? The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And my heart gets hot when I think about all the Christians who know how to go to heaven and all their friends and family and neighbors and co-workers and community people living in the community. They're on their way to hell, and, we, and most of us don't do anything to try to help. My heart gets hot. And I want to do something about it. That's why I'm a daily soul winner. That's why I went soul winning today. That's why I went soul winning yesterday and the day before. Why? Because there's a real hell and there are people going there. And, there's, and they're not just bad people who want to go to hell. They would love to go to heaven if someone just cared enough to show them how. And give them the gospel. Number six and last. Look at Matthew 6, 33. Last verse. Last point and I'll wrap it up. Matthew 6, 33. <sighs> Matthew 6, verse 33. Very famous verse. Matthew 6, 33, it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. My heart is hot within me, and it burns about God and the work of God being neglected. My heart burns how many times over the years have I heard people get upset with me and upset with my preaching all because I try to get them to put the kingdom of God first? Do you know how many times I've heard people say, put God first? That's not what this verse says. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Does anybody know where the kingdom of God is in 2020? It's the church. God says you're supposed to prioritize the things of God, the kingdom of God. That's what it says. Seek ye first. First what? First in priority. It doesn't mean neglect your family. It doesn't mean don't ever work a job and pay your bills. It doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean put it first. Prioritize the things of God. Why? Because the things of God are eternal. They'll last forever. You know, I've got a wonderful house that God's provided for me. And I take care of that house. I do the best I can. I, I fix it and, you know, try to repair it if there's damage and try to make, maintain my house and take care of it. But you know what? That house ain't going to be in heaven. When I die, my house is not going to be in heaven. But when I die, the souls of men will be. When I die, the offering that I put in the offering plate, the Bible says I'm laying up treasures in heaven. When I make a difference in the lives of people, and I, I invest, I love, I care, I help people, all of that's going to be in heaven. All the effects of that is going to be in heaven. I'm laying up treasures in heaven. And you know what? I honestly put the things of God, the kingdom of God, first in priority in my life. And I've never been sorry for it. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then it says, all these things shall be added unto you. What's sad is I see Christians putting all these things first and the kingdom of God last. 
and they've got it backwards. If you'd put the kingdom of God first, God says, I'll give you all these things. Who is better able to take care of you and your family, God or you? I sure think God could take care of me a lot better than I could take care of me. So if I learn this, you know, my heart gets hot about God and the work of God being neglected. Oh, my soul, you listen to me. God is so, such a wonderful God. His work is so important. Don't neglect it. My heart gets hot within me, number one, about the youth of America. Number two, about America turning her back on God. Number three, about carnal Christianity. Number four, about false religions and false doctrines. Number five, about the souls of men on their way to hell. And number six, about God and the work of God being neglected. Listen, don't let your heart get cold to these things. Start musing a little bit. Let the fire burn. And then like David, he said, then I spake with my mouth. Then do something about it. Get stirred up. Get your heart hot. Get fired up for these things. And then we can make a real difference in our world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. I sure do love you. And I'm so grateful for all that you do for us. Thank you, Lord, for each and every person who took time to come to church tonight. I do sincerely appreciate them. And I'm so happy that they came. There's a whole bunch of people that could have came tonight but didn't. I don't know all the reasons. I really don't know. But I know that these people came, and I pray that you bless them for it. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. How many of you are here tonight and say, Preacher, one or more of those six points, God clearly spoke to my heart. Would you pray for me about it? Would you raise your hand? Preacher, pray for me. God clearly spoke to my heart. Heavenly Father, you see all the hands that are raised. I thank you, Lord, for speaking to their hearts. And Lord, whatever it is you spoke to them about, please encourage them and help them to respond with obedience. And if they do, bless them for it. And Lord, help us to make a real difference in our world. We love you, dear Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? The pianist will begin to play. If God spoke to your heart, now you come. Let God have his way in your life. Come kneel and pray at the altar. If you'd like to make a decision,